Good evening, and welcome to this installment of the Curator's Crypt from an actual crypt. Behind me lie the remains of the 72 victims of the Great Richmond Theater Fire. And on tonight's episode, we're going to look at a very special print in the museum's collection that depicts this calamitous event. So let's take a look back into the crypt. So here it is. It's on display in our Old Stone House exhibit. It's an 1812 print of the Great Richmond Theater Fire of December 26, 1811, the night after Christmas. The reason we have this here is because it's the last place that Poe's mother, Eliza Poe, a famous actress, ever performed. Um, in October of that year, she performed in a play called The Stranger. This might also be the first and last place Edgar performed on stage. She was in a play called Cinderella. She was playing one of the Three Graces, and there was a part for a Cupid, which they think might have been played by a little two-year-old Edgar. So possibly there's a connection to both of them. So it's got a lot of connection to Poe's life. Unfortunately, today it's most remembered because 18 days after Poe's mother died, it burned to the ground. And this is a print done up in Philadelphia at the time commemorating that fire and the 72 victims. So where was Edgar? Well, he had just been orphaned and had been taken in by foster parents, John and Francis Allen. And they were spending Christmas with friends over at Turkey Island. So that's about a few miles southeast of Richmond so that's why he missed the fire. His sister had also been orphaned. She was still here in town living with her foster mother, Jane Scott McKenzie, who's right over here. So there is Poe's little baby sister, Rosalie. She's just a little bit older right here. Nope. And this is Jane Scott McKenzie. And she was also a big theater goer and likely would have gone to the theater that night. And something I want to point out to you about this portrait, we got this from Jane Scott McKenzie's granddaughter who lived out in Matthews County, Virginia. And she said, be sure not to damage the little locket here. It has the initials JG on it. And if you look closely, you'll see that JG. That stands for Joseph Gallejo. He was born in Spain, came here in the 1790s, and started the largest flour mill in the country, right here in Richmond. And after her husband died, he gave thousands of dollars to take care of her, and also to take care of her little foster child, Rosalie McKenzie Poe. So very close families. In fact, she named one of her sons Joseph Gaiho McKenzie and one of her daughters, Mary Gaiho McKenzie. So Mary is Joseph's wife, and I'm going to show you her right over this way. So this is Mary Gaiho. This is a painting by Thomas Sully done about 1806 that would have been hanging in the McKenzie house while Poe was a kid. He would have seen this numerous times, undoubtedly would have heard the story of Mrs. Gaiho. And we got this from the same source as we got the portrait of Mrs. McKenzie in the other room for Mrs. McKenzie's granddaughter. Now she, of course, fabulously wealthy. Her husband owned this huge flour mill. So when they went to the theater, they went in style. They didn't have to sit down in the gallery with the riffraff. They had a box, box number eight, right up top. And that night, the night after Christmas, she was sitting there with her stepdaughter, Sally Conyers, with one of Sally's friends who was... Lucy Madison, James Madison's niece. One person who wasn't there was Jane McKenzie. She'd intended to go, but had to cancel the last minute because 
her little foster child, Rosalie, was sick and she had to stay home and take care of Poe's little sister, so she dodged that bullet. Another person that wasn't in the box that night was Sally Conyers' boyfriend, Lieutenant James Gibbon of the U.S. Navy. He was a dashing young military figure and the talk of the town was they were going to get married one day. He was supposed to go to the theater with her but dropped out because he had a strange dream the night before. He dreamt that there was a huge empty chamber that a dark face illuminated by an eerie light approached him and he knew this was an omen and he should absolutely not go to the theater that night so he said I'm not going and Sally of course was furious how can you humiliate me like this by not going to the theater so he did end up showing up he showed up late and he didn't get into box eight he sat nearby but she wouldn't have any part of it and eventually he left early here we are with another copy of that print of the theater fire. Now this one hasn't been hand colored, it's not framed, it's been cropped a little on the edges. But we can take a closer look at this one and it really tells us the story of what was going on there. Now the theater was huge, you can see just from the picture. 600 plus people were packed into the theater that night and out of a population of about 10,000 in Richmond, that was a lot of people. And these included all classes of life. The poor, the middle class sat downstairs in the gallery. Upstairs in those fancy boxes were the elite. We had the governor. We had the president of Bank of Virginia, a former U.S. congressman. So people who knew people were in this fire that night. And it was a big night after Christmas celebration. There was a double bill. The first play started at 7. The next one started around 10. It was a comedy called The Bleeding Nun. I'm not sure what's funny about bleeding nuns back then, but they thought it was a hoot. And people were sitting down. The first act had concluded. And then during the second act, people started to see sparks landing on the stage. And supposedly comments on the interesting lighting effects and how realistic that is until one of the actors came out and said, fire! And people start to evacuate. They rushed to the front door, which opened inward. So people were slamming against the door, trampling each other. You can see in the print, just piles of bodies here. Others are jumping out the windows. That was the only means of escape for a lot of them. Upstairs in box number eight where Mary was, there was one narrow hallway that took you to the narrow staircase to get back down. So many people crammed on that staircase at the same time that it collapsed under their weight. So people really were being tossed out the window. A fellow named James McCall started lowering women down. An enslaved man named Gilbert Hunt showed up and started catching the women. It said he rescued about a dozen different women who were lowered out to him. In fact, one of the visitors to the Poe Museum said that one of his ancestors was lowered out by her pigtails and caught by Gilbert Hunt. And he stayed there right up until the wall collapsed. The man who was tossing the women out to him, who is James McCaw, actually jumped, broke both of his legs, couldn't walk again for the rest of his life. But it shows you just how panicked people were. The church spells started ringing the alarm that people had to come and rescue these people one of those people who heard the alarm was James Given, our naval hero, who rushed back to rescue his beloved Sally Conyers. By the time he got there, he couldn't take the stairs to get upstairs to her box because it collapsed. So he jumped on the stage, he climbed up to get into her box and found her there. And he, one of his friends, carried her almost outside, but then eventually James had to be the hero and said, you know what? I've got her, I can carry out myself, you go rescue more people. So his friend took off, and that's the last they ever saw of James and Sally. By the time it was all over, 72 people had died, including the governor of Virginia, whose body was taken outside. It was described as a crisp heap, only identifiable by his buckles. After this, the whole city would appear in public mourning. These families were so well connected, so many people had died. Even the U.S. Congress, both houses, declared a solemn day of mourning 
in Richmond, all acting, dancing, any sort of fun was banned for four months afterwards. Many people blamed acting. Newspapers said that this fire had been God's punishment and he should burn down all the theaters in America, be rid of actors altogether. They were the scourge of humanity. And Poe growing up as a kid in the aftermath of this had to bear that stigma of having been an actress's son and kids made fun of him and picked on him for this. But needless to say, it was decided that they should never build another theater on that spot. So they appointed a committee headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, John Marshall, to decide what to do with all these bodies, most of them unrecognizable. And he decided the best memorial for all these victims would be a church. So here is an early mezzotint engraving of the church, monumental church, built directly over the mass grave of those victims. And it's a strange little building, doesn't really look much like a church. It was designed by the first native-born professional architect in America, Robert Mills, who was a student of Thomas Jefferson. So he was looking back to ancient architecture. And when the church was built, they never did build this spire just has this low dome with a portico in front. It was designed to look like an ancient tomb. It was decorated with scenes of mourning and death. And as you walk up these front steps, there's a ceremonial urn with upturned torches. These are torches being extinguished, another sign of mourning. It's got mourning faces. And on the base of that, the names of all the 72 victims of the fire. And those 72 victims ended up right here underneath the sanctuary of Monumental Church, or at least what's left of them. There was so little left they couldn't really distinguish one body from the next, except for our old friend Mary Gallejo, who they apparently recognized from her jewelry. But she was just one of the many victims who are listed on the plaque just above the church. So next time you're in the museum and you see that print hanging over above the door, you have a little better idea of why it's there. And although Poe did not write any work specifically based on the theater fire, it's tempting to think that maybe the conqueror worm, which portrays life as a tragic play, being destroyed by a blood red thing, is somehow inspired or influenced by it. So how about we close out this episode with a little reading of Poe's classic poem, The Conqueror Worm. Lo, tis a gala night within the lonesome latter years, an angel throng, bewinged, bedight in veils, and drowned in tears, sit in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres. Mimes in the form of God on high, mutter and mumble low, and hither and thither fly. Mere puppets they, who come and go at bidding of vast formless things that shift the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings invisible woe. That motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot, with its phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, through a circle that ever returneth in to the selfsame spot, and much of madness, and more of sin, and horror the soul of the plot. But see, amid the mimic rout, a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that writhes from out the scenic solitude. It writhes, it writhes, with mortal pangs the mimes become its food, and seraphs sob at vermin fangs and human gore imbued. Out! Out of the lights, out all, and over each quivering form, the curtain, a funeral pall, comes down with the rush of a storm, and the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, affirm that the play is the tragedy man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. <laughs>